I'm Steve Vibronix, and this is the Life in Dub podcast, talking to people who live their lives in dub and reggae. Episode number 15. Welcome to the 15th Life in Dub podcast. I hope you're all doing okay out there. Thanks for taking the time to listen to the podcast. And let me know what you think, and if you have any suggestions, you can email me at vibronix at gmail.com. And you can visit the podcast website, lifeindub.com, where you can listen back to any of the older episodes. Don't forget to tell your friends about Life in Dub and to help share these amazing reggae life stories. This week, I want to talk about Leicester, again, because it's a subject I seem to keep coming back to. As I record this, Leicester is the only UK city under an extra strong lockdown due to a recent surge in virus cases. Day to day, it hasn't had much of an impact on what I do. I can still go to the studio and not that much has changed. But what it has done is shown how the virus situation that affects us all, regardless of where we are, is ever changing and unpredictable. And what that means for musicians like me is that it's even harder to make plans for the future. Right now, we can't leave the city, and as bad news spreads, some countries have imposed special quarantine on anyone who's spent time in Leicester, so travelling has yet more challenges. It brings into question how is it going to be possible to plan travels, meetings, projects going forward. I'm generally pretty positive about the future, and I'm not trying to be a prophet of doom or anything, but this little Leicester lockdown that I'm in the middle of right now is proof that 2020 will continue to throw up challenges and to make all our lives that much harder. So it's no wonder that I've spent the last two weeks refitting the Vibronics dub cupboard studio. Maybe that's the last place I have any control over. This week, my guest is Strider from Dub Chasm in Bristol. Strider's a prominent figure in the reggae and sound system arena, having started out on pirate radio back in the 90s. He's now maybe best known as being one half of the mighty dub chasm, but he's also promoter of the legendary teachings in dub nights in Bristol and is about to launch a new radio show. As well as all things dub chasm and teachings in dub, we talked a lot about the city of Bristol, a city that's really like no other here in the UK and somewhere that's given Vibronics so much support over the years. So enough of me, let's get on with the interview. So Strider, welcome to the Life in Dub podcast. Hey Steve, it's great to be here and um, yeah, great to be chatting with you. Big up to all the listeners tuned into uh, Life in Dub. And you're down there in Bristol. I'm sure I can hear a few tractors in the background, so you, you must be in Bristol. <laughs> yeah, I'll just go and take my goat around the corner and tie him up, actually. <laughs> yeah, everyone always loves the uh, the Bristol jokes. My Hopefully my Bristolian <laughs> accent can be uh, understood by everybody. Yeah, I'll, maybe I'll put some subtitles on it. <laughs> Well, listen, what I'm doing is I'm asking everybody um, the same question at the beginning of, of the, the podcast, which is like, it's just something to kickstart it off. It's nothing too serious, but it's like just to name a track, something that really had a big influence on you and really kind of turned a corner or kind of changed things for you. It's like just sort of something in that sort of area. So I don't know if you've got something you want to talk about in as an example of that. Yeah, it's um, actually um, a question. I know you sent the, that that question over earlier, and it's something I was thinking. Mm, I'm not, you know, it's amazing when you ask these things. It's like brings up all types of well, there's this tune, there's that tune, but because you specifically said um, it changed my life, uh, there's this tune by Dubcastle called Victory. Now, any joking? <laughs> 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 there's um, if I go right back to the beginnings. Um, something that really got me into uh the music was well the way my kind of um road into it was through pirate radio and tuning into um i remember as a kid probably about 12 years old or something tuning into um the pirate radio and and i remember i was i was up quite late listening to it and my mum came and knocked the door bedroom door and said um you know you need to turn it off now and i remember actually saying to her I like reggae now, mum. <laughs> it was a, it was like, you know, a, um, a point in my life where it's like I tried out different musics. You know, when you're, I don't know, nine, ten, eleven, you're listening to various stuff, and uh, and and at at that age, by tuning into the radio, it's like wow. When it came through the speakers, I instantly locked onto it, and and that sound just inspired. Oh, this this me. is for me. Yeah, exactly. I thought this is me, and um, and and I 
I love this music. And then that led me to buy like my first records. And I think um, probably strangely to a lot of people, my uh, the record I'm going to choose is an album and it's um, Reggae Hits Volume 8. Um, nice. And, you know, remember the Reggae Hits series? I don't know if they're still going, but they've... Um, they're probably on like reggae hits 50 odd or something now, but back then reggae hits eight, um, it, it, all those tunes, it was literally my window into this music. And, um, and I, the, the roots music and the dub music came later. It was actual, actually those lovers songs and dance all that uh, I, for, that was the sound I first picked up on. So that really, in answer to your question, that really changed my life, I would say, because from that point of tuning into the radio and then getting that record, I've never looked back. Right well, to so it shows a kind of intent as well of like, I'm going to buy an album full of reggae music. It's like this because I want to listen to reggae music It's because like yeah. I'm into this thing. This is what I like now. Yeah, exactly. And those compilations were, were great for that. You know, it was all the hits of that year. So um, it so was you were a growing up in, in You were growing up in Bristol then, yeah? Yeah, this was all in Bristol. I, I spent my early years in growing up in inner city Bristol. And then um, my teens, um, my parents then moved out so we could have a bigger garden. And it was, um, it was a bit further out in Bristol. And then because of that, the radio like when i was young i remember like my parents taking me to st paul's carnival um the annual caribbean carnival in bristol and um seeing black mates from my primary school on the floats and involved in the carnival that was that was what was going on in those early years but when we moved house i didn't have so much access to that so the the pirate radio was literally um a window back into to that life and uh, inner city bristol really and did you feel like, because cause I come from like a really crappy little town in the east of England and nothing ever happened there and nothing happened since. It's just kind of a one-horse town, if you like. Yeah. But Bristol's one of those, it's it's a great city and it kind of always has been. And was there a sense of living somewhere where this this is where things can happen? Absolutely. I mean, it was really, um, it, it, it was a really exciting time to be a teenager as well, actually, in the 90s, because obviously you had Massive Attack and... Uh, tricky and and stuff coming out and making a real worldwide impact. I remember going to my cousins in uh, in London in the nineties, and uh, they thought it was really cool that I was from Bristol because that's where Tricky was from. We had that as a given. It was just like that. This is Bristol, so you kind of take it for granted a bit when you're here. With Digi living with where he did um, in an area called Cotton, which is close to it was really inner city bristol um it's it's close to a lot of uh where reggae music was going on and dances were happening um going to visit um in school days you know on weekends and stuff that w- was really great for me to like the amount of record shops we could go to and then dances that were going on pirate radio stations that were happening the city has always been rich in in the culture and you mentioned a few times like pirate radio and like that was one of your sort of doorways into kind of into the music because it used to be a big thing here up in Leicester as well. It's kind of um, Fresh FM and uh, GCR FM and and you, you had this like, you had like a great rota of, of really good shows all dealing with like different kinds of black music and the kind of music you just weren't hearing on like traditional radio or whatever. And it was, um, yeah, it was a kind of real lifeline and a real kind of, like source of information you know what i mean absolutely and and we're talking about a time pre-internet where you know it, 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 for younger listeners it must be quite hard to imagine a time before the internet when you could just get all this information and um listen to all these different sounds but literally the the pirate radio was your source um for that music and it, like you say it wasn't being played on on other uh, legal stations and um and the variety as well like some of these pirate radio stations in bristol were great at what they did i used to tune into such wicked dance or shows r&b shows um and hip-hop shows as well as obviously um root shows and there weren't so many root shows on the radio so the few that there were on pirate radio they that that was my weekly staple and and in turn that 
um, that there's a guy called Skelly Roots, and I used to tune in every Sunday. And, um, Did you used to tape them as well? Oh, always tape them. It was yeah. like, yeah, I, I was an avid tape. I, in fact, I've just been, um, because of the COVID-19 situation and given us more time, I've been in the attic and there's just bin liners full of tapes and they're old session tapes, but also loads of old pirate radio tapes. And I, I've been playing some back recently and the vibe, the vibe is so strong, even still. And um, And it was so exciting when, you know, that station might come off air, they've got raided or whatever, and then it's just, it's dead, it's dead air, it's just a... a yeah, when when they went away, it was like, it was, I remember it being such a loss. It's a void, isn't it? People were risking, you know, risking, you know, their sort of, you know, risking being arrested, you know, for the sake of broadcasting music and, you know, and that, that's unimaginable these days, is people going to that length setting up an illegal transmitter and an, an illegal radio station in a block of flats or in someone's house somewhere. It's kind of just so people can play music. It's like, it's crazy. And I think that because of the risk involved, I think the energy of some of those shows, it, it comes across, you know, it's raw and it's ghetto and it's, um, it's real. And I think, I think um, that, that I, I'm so thankful to have had that pirate radio schooling um, in terms of listenership and then in terms of my own involvement in, a few years later, you know? So, like, going forward a few years, I mean, I'm also talking about pirate radio because you, you got involved in it yourself at some point, I guess. So how, how did that make the transition from kind of, you know, living on the edge of Bristol to being in that kind of pirate radio in the heart of the city? Well, um, I, I I was such an avid listener. Um, like I said, had the, the favourite um, go to shows. So uh, the one person, uh, Skelly Roots, who was like the main root show on Magnum FM at the time, and then on Rag FM, and he um, he would announce various events that were coming up. It wouldn't be any real way of me knowing about them other than through that radio show. And then he also and um, used to announce that he did uh, a monthly record store at the watershed in the centre of Bristol. So I went down there and actually met him face to face and um, then, you know, bought, started to buy a few records from him. And then in turn, he gave me um, a couple of flyers and, and I would go to Gaffer's uh, Club Dub event, which was a, sp- a Bristol spin on the popular London dub club at the time. This is Gaffer, <laughs> like Ar- Armageddon or whatever yes, it was called. Yeah. Yeah, 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 Dr. Gaffer. And um, he was doing big things in Bristol at that time, pushing the dub sound. And uh, and I'd go to some, they were fortnightly at a club called the Malap Club. And um, I'd go along and then I'd, I'd see Skelly Root, so I actually knew someone. <laughs> and then it was a very small nucleus of people at that time. It wasn't very popular at all. And then, yeah, in 1996, um, I, two friends were playing on Rag FM, one of the main pirate radios of the time. And, um, my mate said to me, um, dark man, he said to me, Oh, I need someone to answer the phone. So I went on to answer the phones for him. And, uh, he said, you're going like to have a sort of pirate radio internship. Yeah. Yeah. And he said, are oh, you going to have to think of a name if you can answer the phone and, uh, you can't just be Sam. So I, I was going to call myself DJ stepper. And then, and we had a friend who had that nickname already. So I was like, okay, step, I'd always heard steppers and striders, uh, shocking out in the roots dance. I'd hear that shouted out on the radio. So I went for uh, DJ strider instead. And that's how, that's how it started, really. I always wanted to get involved, and then I, I I spoke to the management, and they gave me my own show. And in in 1996, I started broadcasting on Rag FM and went down with on my moped. <laughs> that was still when it was proper pirate. This is like illegal. Oh, hundred percent illegal. Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you know, I I um, you turn up and you've been given this address and it's like right it, i remember going down going to going there one time and um and you've got to knock the door and then this lady answered and it's obviously it's her place um and the the management are using a room in her house and um and that's where it is for that for that time now you know none of us had mobile phones or anything so one time i went down and and, and it wasn't there anymore and then i'm chucking pound after pound into the 
public phone box to phone the manager. To phone the to, one guy who does he have a had mobile, a mobile. Phone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's it. In those and days, like so you say, expensive. it's pound by pound. Yeah, it, and um, and then he's telling me the new address to go to, and because it was always moving to hide from the DTI, and we were we were briefed. We'd have meetings that would happen, and uh, where the whole uh, uh, Rag FM crew would get together, and we'd discuss. Uh, do's and don'ts and what would what happens if you do get raided when you're in there and apparently if you held on to all your records um they couldn't confiscate anything that was on your person I, i'm never sure how true this was but this is what we were told they couldn't confiscate what you had on your person they would just um seize all the equipment and stuff in the room so i always planned on grabbing my most precious biscuits and like shoving them <laughs> under my coat or something but luckily i was it the studio was never raided when i was in there um and it, i it, they did the, they hit the show after mine one time so it was really close um um, very often the management would set up uh the, the transmitter would be set up elsewhere and the studios in another place but you know there were comings and goings every two hours so these places were quite hot um you're either you know someone's either selling drugs there or running a pirate radio at the time like what are all these people doing coming coming and going so we, we transmitted from high-rise flats from old uh dis disused uh ganja grow rooms in attics and basements that stank and you know it, it was just all people all have got no place. idea the kind of how the lengths that we used to have to go to just to better broadcast music out to people it's like it's cra crazy stuff definitely but through that came you know when you were in tune and like i said when it would go off air when it when it would suddenly come back on air and you'd hear that <laughs> and you think oh my god there's a signal and then suddenly the tune would blast through it was amazing you know and i used to i used to absolutely love it when i was a teenager and and, it, and the pirate would kick back in um but especially bringing it forwards in, into our dub sound during the 90s when you would suddenly hear a a, a, a digital dub production like i don't know mixman or something blasting through on pirate radio like it was already a vibe and an energy when some dance or tunes being played and whatever but there were endless dance or shows at the time but when you'd get that rare moment of suddenly someone running a king david warrior dubwise blasting through the pirate radio honestly it was just so amazing and powerful because, uh, yeah. And hard to find. That's that, It's the same situation up here in Leicester. It's like you couldn't get hold of enough of that music. And that music in the 90s, especially you know, people like Black and Mix and Dub Judah and Alpha and Amiga and Disciples and all the people that kind of sort of founded the sound, if you like, is that there weren't that many tunes coming out and we, we couldn't get enough of them, really. That was the kind of sense here, you know what I mean? Yeah. Definitely. And uh, and like I said, it was that small nucleus of people keeping the whole thing going, attending the dances. Um, you know, you, you'd get a bit more of a of a ram dance when Shaka would come down from time to time at the Malcolm X Centre or Trinity Centre. But overall, lots of those with local selectors playing at the club dub events, they, you know, the the crowds were pretty thin to be honest with you and it was it was people who were really into that music and you had to like you say you had to really seek it out and then find the shops with them or a record dealer um there was no discogs <laughs> and what what made you want to become like a presenter because like, i've had to kind of force myself to be the presenter of like this podcast series because i'm much happier in the studio or behind the equipment whatever but but you you were there from like day one presenting it and talking and whatever so that's that's a really good kind of bold move and i was wondering like what what kind of made you want to do that and go about it in that sort of way i mean i think um uh I was so influenced by pirate radio and pirate radio DJs. I, I just wanted to be involved in something I love so much. At 16, I answered the phones um, for a, a, there was a monthly RSL, Respect FM, and I phoned up and volunteered down there. And I got to meet some of the DJs. And like I said, helping friends out on their show. It was, it was the way I wanted to play this music I loved. So I, I didn't have dreams at that point of building my own sound system. I dreamt about getting on the airwaves because it had made such an impact on my life. And to then to end up broadcasting from those same radio stations that I'd loved listening to and meeting lots of the same 
um, people that I, you know, you I met the voices that were part of my upbringing and uh, playing all types of music and and it was it was amazing you know it was a real thing being a part of rag fm and then passion fm back then you go into a record shop and you'd see some of the other djs playing other genres of music and it'd be like yo yeah rag fm crew and it was it was a thing it was felt it felt it felt wicked and you seem to take it like seriously. I and mean, I remember, I think one of our first interactions was you, you sent me a cassette where you played one of my early tunes on on the radio show. And I think it's that kind of like, look, I'm promoting the music because you know we didn't know each other, and then you know Bristol seemed like a million miles away from Leicester. So it's like there you are saying, look, I'm playing your tunes on the airwaves here in Bristol, and like just want to show you that we're supporting it and everything. And but that was that those kind of that reaching out to people is like a really good thing to do to help people realise that these records are being promoted by people. And you you seem to be really on the case with that, and that obviously must have made the show like you know, giving you access to lots of music and stuff. Yeah, hundred percent. I, I, my friend DJ technique, um, who was on the pirate radio at the same time and doing a hip hop show. And he looked at me one time and he said, he pulled out his mixtape and he said, don't underestimate the power of a tape. <laughs> it sounds, it sounds a bit corny now, but actually he was right in those days. Yeah. In those days it was so, it was crucial because you couldn't connect with people in the way that people connect now. So he was talking like, I think him, him back at the time, there was a big DJ playing at, um, at a club in Bristol and he took his mixtape down. He no, he posted his mixtape to this guy. And when he went to link the guy, um, you know, there are all these other DJs involved, but the guy was like, yo, your technique. Yeah, you sent me your mixtape. That was wicked. And and that was what he meant by the power of a tape. You know, it's a way of um, of letting somebody know what you do. So I did. I followed that advice with with the show and I, I, I went, ventured off to interview people, but also just sent out recordings of the show. Because, you know, back then we taped everything, didn't we? Sessions, radio, whatever. It was all, it all yeah, got recorded. Sure. So I recorded every show and I, I started to send them out to people. There's that letter online going around where the iration dug out of me writing to him in like 98 or something, <laughs> saying, which very much is what I must have done with you as well. Um, same to ABBA and, and, and everybody. And it, I think, I think for people in our, in our struggling, and I, you know, because it, a lot of people don't realize because dubs got so big now but it was struggling the scene was it was a hard one wasn't it it wasn't yeah it was it was a small scene and it, it, it was it was kind of sort of kept alive by diehard lovers of the music exactly kind of yeah ruthlessly carried on with it yeah and i think that's why me sending a tape to producers or labels of of uh the and them realizing god there's somebody in bristol playing the stuff in another city that meant a lot more to the likes of yourself or or um or whoever in the scene than it possibly would have in other genres that were bigger from and 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 people grew to love those those tapes so like it was pretty mad for me to re- to think that abba shanty's driving around hackney blasting at a suffrage choice <laughs> show and levi roots is driving around brixton doing the same and iration's got it on in um in it up in Leeds and it's like yeah that, that I think for me that's why looking back on it all that's why um after 10 years on pirate radio when it when the pirate went on to the internet that's why I got a bigger listenership than I might have otherwise is because people had heard about these tapes and and the tapes had circulated in the scene so again that, those tapes did it did go a long way the power of a tape <laughs> And also, like in in those times as well, you're talking like '90s and stuff in Bristol. Then um, I guess you're going to dances and getting immersed in in that side of things as well as like pirate radio. Yeah, going to those sessions. My, you know, the first session Digi and I went to was um, was Shaka at the Malcomet Centre in 1993, and we were 15, and um, we got in. Shaka was late, <laughs> um, and we it was incredible just to watch. Um, the Shaka crew string up that was a teaching in itself and then um, yeah you sort of move the sound and everything and... absolutely you know suddenly they arrived and 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 you know things like uh there's a, a brother called Rasmatevia rocker and he was um dressed in a tracksuit and he was doing all these limbering up and pr- um, sort of press ups and stuff and I think I, I was a 15 year old kid thinking like you know what what's this guy doing and then when Shaka 
started touching the music when he signed on, my man starts to spring into some proper skanking because skanking was a real thing then, wasn't it? And um, he started to really move, and I realised he was limbering up for the dance. It was that serious, you know. And to to, to witness all those things in the early part is just as um, meaningful as the actual dance itself. And we were under a curfew from our parents actually, so we only got forty five minutes of music. <laughs> and I remember no, no dub plates for you. Then. No, definitely didn't get any dub plates. But that forty five minutes was such so powerful because it was like that. That really cemented, you know, like, oh, you know what, this is to hear the music you've been listening to on pirate radio and on record suddenly through a sound system it was like this cements it and it made sense of it all and it's like this is what where we want to be this is this is so powerful and we never look back from from then really and what what was going on in in bristol around that time you you getting regular dances and kind of sounds playing and stuff it was in the in the mid to late nineties, it was really, really thin in Bristol. There was hardly you can't imagine it now, can you? You can't. It really, it's a surprise to lots of people. I mean, people sometimes some people have moved to Bristol, dub lovers who you know because the scene's so strong. But back then, it was really was the diehards, and dancehall was so popular and it dominated. You know. All my friends were like, why are you listening to my dad's music? Like, you know, and, we, and so I would still go out to dance all events as, as socially. And some of those were wicked. But um, but I, you know, in terms of loving roots and dub wise, it was, um, yeah, you, you, you had to be a real diehard fan to kind of seek it out. And so we would have to go to London. There was a few of us and we would we would venture off to London where the scene was much stronger and go to hear Shaka at the Rocket, and then of course go to um, the uh, the University of Dub Sessions when they started. I think my first one was it wasn't at the Brixton Rec; it was at maybe Brixton Academy, of uh, uh, one of the mm-hmm. University of Dubs. And hearing three sounds strung up, and that was when I'd heard Abba at the Small Hall Malcolm X in '94 in Bristol, and he was so heavy; it was crazy. But then I I was there then a real shaka item. I was going to shaka all the time in London. And the first time I went to hear ABBA in London was at that, one of those very first uh, few uh, university of dub sessions. And I remember that the, the, the kind of hunger at which ABBA ran the sound, the energy and the weight, there was no weight like it in that time. And it just blew yeah, he was, me away. He was coming in with intent, definitely. Yes, it was, exactly it was that. Then. Yeah, and and he was running. I remember at that time he was running all the dub plate cuts of tunes that came on on that album with Rasaya um, and the Shantyites, and it, it just blew me away. And um, yeah, I I, <laughs> I was just locked into that vibe, you know. Going just going back to Bristol briefly. I mean, I, I remember hearing Shaka play. He was out at a carnival and he was playing outside in like a like a basketball court or something like that. I'm not, I'm not sure when that would have been, but that, cause that was one of my early times yeah. to Bristol and it was just kind of like, wow, Bristol's the coolest place ever. Cause like yeah. you've got Shaka <laughs> playing for free outside all night. This is mad. But that was a bit of a one-off thing. I oh, guess. That was a, kind of, yeah. I mean, that was, um, a sta- that was my favorite Shaka session ever. And I've been to so many. And when, when was that? I reckon that was something like, when, when did, Ja Light, Ja Love come out. Your, your that came race. out in 98. Yeah, it was it was 98 then, because he played um, Ja Light, Ja Love, 7-inch, followed by, um, what's the other one? Rod of Correction, Ja Free. Yeah, the Ja Free tune. Yeah, yeah tune. and um, he, he played both of those, at that, and they were fresh, you know? So I remember it must have been 98, and um, St. Paul's Carnival, or St. Paul's Festival, as we've always called it locally, that um, the festival used to go on right through the night. You know, I remember being there at Raven at like seven in the morning and stuff. And so Shaka came down and he, I think he signed on at maybe 4 p.m. And he didn't sign off till 4 a.m. And the people that attended as well, because there was no admission fee, it got some, you know, there's a a strong Rasta community in Bristol over, over many years. And people came out the woodwork that day, you know, they were all there and 
And there's this sound that they'd heard back in the day still firing. And he sent people mad round there. I mean, it was it was dread. The vibe was yeah, incredible. Yeah, I, I remember it being really intense and really like, wow, Bristol is the place. And it's kind of, it really like, yeah, I, I, it's very memorable. And obviously, you know, my first record just come out and he's playing my record and everything. So. Yeah, and and you know, for you, that's absolutely massive. And I remember that for me, that was what... Um, that was the first time I'd heard of of Vibronics because I got those I got those tunes after, and then it came out on an album. Did they after the, the yes, first, yeah, yeah, yeah. me and, and Joffrey did an album together. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, and they had a real impact through through Shaka because Shaka was so great at running running those tunes, and then you'd, you'd have to dig them out after because he wouldn't announce who it was. <laughs> so again, it was back to that diehards in the scene, you know, doing their homework. But but that was you know that was a great. Um, a great vibe for you and all of us to have in Bristol then in 98, but you know, week in week out, there weren't, um, warrior sessions going on like that. There, um, loads of dance or, but not so much of that. So that, and you know, that's why I ever started promoting really. I was just about to ask exactly that. Is that is that why? Because that's. I mean, I, I used to run promotions here in Leicester. Me and Richie Roots did, and it's for the same reason. There's nothing going on, so it's like let's put some dances on. Because obviously now, you know, teachings in Derby is like one of the you know the main kind of brands and like sound system events in the country. So so how how, how did the promoting thing all begin? I mean, what what was all that about? Well, I was. Um originally it was just to to have a chance to play so me and the same crew that i said will venture up to london to catch the vibes ras kama and ras addis we we were on the radio we were the root spot crew <laughs> and um i ran my sufferer's choice alternately with them doing the roots us three doing the root spot show as well and then and then we ventured into playing a sound system with uh, someone called Levi, who owned the equipment, and and we called ourselves the Root Spot Crew at first, but then Negus Melody Sound System. So um, we wanted to play, and so through Passion FM, we we were able to put on a few sessions jointly with them, and it gave us the chance to play Iration Steppers and stuff like that. Channel One skip on a few years. Um, I uh, to when I was no longer in the sound because I realised how much of a commitment and work sound system was. And with my radio works, dub chasm and stuff, it was just I couldn't juggle it all. Oh, yeah, that's the thing. It has to, has to be your thing. That's it. And it's got to be your your passion and your dream. And I realised it was, it was a vibe, but it wasn't really... F- I love listening to them, but it wasn't fully my passion. Radio was and the dub chasm works were. So... Um, Bristol Reggae Society at Bristol University, they were interested in um, in getting more involved in some events. And so we chatted to a friend of mine, Pinch, who's a dubstep producer and DJ from Bristol in Bristol. Uh, he, he ran a night called Subloaded and we, we went to a club called Clockwork, which had two floors. So he ran Subloaded from the upstairs and we, we did teachings in dub downstairs. And that, that's how that came about, really. Um, lots of these sessions, like in the early days, you know, they really start small and stuff. But this started with a bang, 2007, because at that point, dubstep was massive. And it was... and. Um, People were literally. It must have been a mad time in Bristol because obviously Bristol was the epicenter of it. I mean, you've already had Ronnie Size and all the kind of jungle drum and bass stuff in the nineties, and then early two thousands, you've got this next. Like, it was the next huge wave. Lift. Yeah, it was definitely a next wave. Pinch kind of helped bring the sound to Bristol, and um, and it it really was crazy. Like people were chucking themselves at us to get into this venue, you know, and um, and so it housed about a thousand but we we got more in, I'm sure. Downstairs was automatically full anyway because there was just so many people coming in and it introduced Roots and Dub Sound System to a, a, a whole audience who would have no who would have otherwise not heard it. And that was kind of the point of Teachings in Dub is to to do it as authentically as possible. For it to be a teaching. To, yeah, for it to be a teaching. That was the whole that was the whole point. And that I feel that that's what we've gone on to do. And and so the yeah. Trinities, I mean when did you move in sorry to cut you, but when did you move into the Trinity? Because the Trinity I don't know if you want to talk about the Trinity at all, because it's such an amazing course, iconic yeah. venue. It seems like the place for it. Uh, it's a, such a beautiful venue and it's got a lot of history for me. Digi and I went to our first ever reggae session there, Aqua Levi and the roots I mentioned band 
uh, Dub Warriors. Did they, did they play his foundation? Do you know what? I don't know because we had to leave too early again because we were about 14. <laughs> um, so we didn't catch the whole thing, but they had Armageddon sound in there um, and that was wicked. So that was our first reggae session and the next one was that shaka one at malcolm x and then also my grandparents got married at the trinity center as well on its own trinity is the ideal venue you know it's so great for sound system and and it's been there for so many years now and it's like the the home of teachings because it's got that big like high ceiling hasn't it and it's kind of but it's it's not so big that it's like a warehouse it's still kind of you know it's it's a nice place to be it's kind of it's definitely a special place it's big but it's also got an intimacy about it as well um the 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 large pillars and um i don't know there's something about it especially especially having sound system down on the floor there um, and it not being a stage show thing, it really it re- you you walk into the venue, but then you, you kind of turn to the side to face whichever sound is playing. And uh, I don't know, there's something about that vibe. I've got, I've got to ask you a question about it as well. Is like who who does the food? Because the food, me and Madhu are just obsessed with the food there. I'm sure we both like manage to sneak <laughs> two portions every time we're there. <laughs> I'm glad I'm glad you um you remember the food. Lots of people seem to remember the food. It's something I've always been adamant about at teachers in dub sessions. Because we get to perform all over the world as dub chasm and we get treated so well in so many countries, I always wanted people's bellies to be full when, uh, when they come and perform at teachings because it's often something that hasn't happened in UK events um, for whatever reason. So having the in-house um, food people there has, um, has always been a big part of it as well. You know, you remember going to those sessions like when I used to go up to London and you could get a veg patty at like 2 a.m. to keep your energy going and stuff. It's a long night, you know, it's like 10 till yeah, 6 sure. in the morning. Um, you wouldn't you wouldn't um, go from 10 a.m. till 6 p.m. and just not eat. So I think food is is a crucial part of it. And so I've had various um, people um, that have done food, food for me there over the years, Caribbean food, which has been, yeah, remembered by many, including yourself. Nice. <laughs> oh, you do, you're doing the right thing there. <laughs> well, listen, the next thing I kind of want to talk about, because there's so much we can talk about, but it's like, you know, the, the word that's been mentioned many times uh, in the interview so far, and the word that's probably most associated you, with you now is, is dubcasm. And it's kind of um, just like maybe a little kind of potted history about how all that begun because it's, it's you and Ben and your, your, your childhood friends is that right that's right yeah our mums met at antenatal class and um oh. yeah that's how deep so it is like, <laughs> you knew each other before you were like human beings yeah so, definitely before you were born yeah I was uh, making release schedules from the from the womb kind of signal to digi <laughs> but no they met at antenatal class and then um, and then when we were a few days old, obviously our mums got together and there would be play dates and whatever. So we were friends. We never lived in the same area in Bristol, but we would meet up on weekends and whatever. And then in, in later years, um, we just happened to get into the same music. So I, as I said earlier with the reggae hits eight mention, I, I really liked, um, I was collecting like sevens and twelves, uh, sort of ragga stuff at the time and also lovers singers like Coco T and Digi loved dub albums so he was buying a lot of the dub LPs and then I got more and more into the root, more rutical side of reggae and um, and then together and, and then Digi started to he was always fiddling with equipment obsessed with that so I was collecting music and he was we would go record shopping together, literally would spend, that would take up the whole of Saturday, you know, you could go around the whole of Bristol and there were so many record shops um, and it, we would do the rounds and then we'd do the rounds the following Saturday to see if, if anything new had come in. And, um, yeah, you got you got to be on it. Yeah, you? it was it was wicked and it was a great way to spend your time as a teenager, you know, kept you out of trouble and um, and into something solid. And and Digi this whole time was like he, he, his dad bought him a, a synthesizer DX11 and um, it was a really cool thing to have and he he was always trying to create sounds and stuff at home 
And then we kind of formed, we naturally formed Dubcasm. We didn't ever sit down and think, well, who's going to do what? We were just two friends into the same thing. He used to send me cassettes and I would listen on my headphones in the school playground. And then I'd write him a letter back and feedback about the <laughs> tune, snail mail style, you know. And then with my starting on pirate radio in 96 the very first uh, radio show i did i played an exclusive dub chasm tune off of cassette um and digi was in tune in his a level art class at, at school um and and i i blasted dub chasm from the very first show so it always connected um and i think that's what's been kind of the unique thing about dub chasm is um both of what we've both brought to the table there with digi then went on to uni in london and um made full use of the university studios and stuff and i was full into the radio uh, mission then and going to interview the likes of tenestelli and shaka abashanti and so on digi would often come along to the interviews and then i'd be able to um uh, link up the singer to to record some words and that's why we did some of those early recordings like Spiritual Warrior Time and The Soul with Tenor. And then Tenor's such a brilliant singer. Such a great He's singer, like, man. Top uh, 10 for me. Yeah, probably. yeah. 100% for the UK scene. He was uh, um, definitely in the top 10. And meeting these greats that I'd been buying records of, it was, it was all such a massive thing for me and a big learning curve. It blended with the radio promotional side it, it it enabled us as dub chasm to get links with the top sounds and singers and um for example after the interview with abba you know digi left him a dat tape because yeah, you made a really strong connection with abba shanti didn't you and like in the stu in terms of the studio and you know as, as a promoter and everything it's kind of he seemed to be kind of really you know kind of like a strong relationship working well together yeah we we were really taken um into the family really um to the shantyite family and and um and that happened very naturally as well you know um digi playing the saxophone ended up being uh, part of the horn section of the shantyites and you'd go for weekly rehearsals at the triangle in hackney and stuff and um and I kept up my friendship with ABBA, sending tapes, long reasonings. I used to work for BT in the call centre, uh, in a call centre back then, and I hated it, you know. It was awful. I did it for years. And um, and I used to make sneaky calls all the time. And, like, this is back, still back in the time when phone calls to mobiles from a landline were absolute fortune. And um, Even city to city on a, yeah, would, would cost a fortune. So yeah. Landline to landline, city to city. People didn't have no idea how difficult it was to communicate in those it days. It was hard, yeah. And I, so I used to have the joke of, you know, BT's slogan is it's good to talk. So I used to phone up all these roots men and like, it must have, I don't know what the bill would have been, but it would have been crazy. Like spend an hour chatting to Shaka on the phone and same with ABBA and so on. And um, yeah, it was great because friendships developed and, um, and, and especially, particularly like Shaka was the first to play dub chasm dubs. And that was such a thrill to be in the session and hear these, these tunes being played. And it wasn't long after the ABBA, ABBA cut some, but with ABBA, as I said, we were taken, taken into the fold really. And, and, um, yeah, that, those kind of apprenticeships are so important to just to learn, especially cause sound, making music for sound system is a very specific thing. And to kind of really kind of get to the, you know, to the roots, if you like, of like of, of how to make music for this particular thing is like is is really important. So crucial, yeah, and and it, it can that can in turn steer the angle and approach you have on the music as well. You know, and I I was around um, it, being in Bristol and then up there in in Hackney with Abba. It it, it you know it's around a lot of um, elder races, and you know they're. Uh, guidance was absolutely crucial and it really helped steer dub chasm tunes like jab bible became quite a quite really quite known like an underground dub plate anthems of the time you know in 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 the small scene even hearing people calling out yo run jab bible it was just amazing at some point you must have um come up with some kind of plan because one, one thing that seems kind of 
the, 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 I, I kind of see in in the way you do dub chasm is like choosing like great artists to collaborate with, whether it's like Dub Judah or Levi Roots or kind of people that a lot of other people maybe aren't working with, but 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 should because they're like super talented. So that's that must have been part of the plan, I guess. Yeah, it was it was kind of like working with people that I came across through the radio show, which obviously I specifically went to interview certain people because I like their work. Um, and people like Dub Tudor was such an inspiration, as I'm sure he would have been for you in that era. Oh, to- totally. He's like, I mean, those, like Dub Tech Dub and stuff is still kind of that, that yeah, I, I got all my ideas from there, really. Yeah, he's, he's a mate, you know, he's an absolute wizard in dub, you know. And and um, and so friends um, who, who were in Negus Melody knew Dub Tudor for many years from the Zulu priest sound days, you know, and... Um, and so, for example, there was a trusted relationship there where when we first, as the Rootspot crew, went to play at the Dub Club in London, Dub Judah and a squad of people turned up and uh, we we br- used to bring the DAT machine there and Kama, Ras Kama would bring his DAT machine and Judah just walked it, walked over and slapped down a DAT tape in Kama's hand and without having heard it, we just obviously hit play and started running all these exclusives and it was it was all the tunes like head creator and stuff way before they came out and um so there was that that trusted relationship which was in turn handed on to to myself and it it it, that that tune from the foundation working with judah didn't happen overnight trust me (laughs) So it, it, these, these things take time it's not like oh come to the studio at three o'clock and i'll give you this money it's like it takes a long long time to build up to these things and just to kind of get all the planets aligned so it actually happens it's and i like, i it's, love it's that thing. i love i love that about the scene and especially about that era you know things are so speedy now and it's like you could you could Facebook message an artist in another country and say, yo, this is what I'm doing, whatever. And they could voice it in their studio and send it back. And you've never met them. You could PayPal them some money and it can all be very speedy. And there's obviously a real, a a really, um, a really good side to that of getting work done. But in terms of um, what happened with our journey is, you know, really firm friendships were established um, by things taking the, the length of time they did. It would be like, you know, linking Judah and then um, having, a, having a reasoning with him at, at, at his studio or, or at a dance or something. And then it would be a case of leaving a tape with him and then hoping to buck up on him two months later at the next Brixton Rec session we've come all the way from Bristol to and have a follow-up reasoning about that. So things took time and you had to be committed and you, you, people would then know you you were serious, you know, and I think that went a long way and, and we, we've, we've gained such firm friendships in the scene um, through things going that way. But what's cool, though, is that what you've done is that obviously doing these underground, you know, dubs directly for the sound man and the sound system or whatever, is when you started the label is that one thing that seems really, the promotion side of it seems really good and well thought out and kind of, you know, so to to then turn it on its head and promote it really well so it really gets out to people, that's like, that's that's a cool thing to do, I think. Yeah, and I, and I think a lot, of, a lot of people tend to think that there's often a bit of a master plan behind stuff we do, but... I don't know. Yeah, it, it, yeah, it's uh, yeah, really behind <laughs> behind closed doors. It's it's still just two friends kind of doing what we do and bringing our different strengths to the table. So yeah, I don't know. It's um, it, I, we do plan a release and stuff like that. We tend to we tend to only work with an artist knowing we're going to follow through and release that rather than. Um, just work with loads of people and just see what happens. Um, but it's not all thought through. Because um, obviously one of the big things is um, is the Victory Tune, which has been more successful than possibly any other like UK sound system Roots Tune ever. Um, and that seemed to have, like watching it go on its journey from being promoted by Abashanti, played at the last session at Notting Hill and all these like big sessions, university, you know, the University of Dub, United Nations of Dub, all these things then get released and then it just kind of went viral and like that must have been quite a ride really. It was an incredible ride. I mean, one never to 
be forgotten you know it it, it was so it's been so special for digi and i and, and did, did, did at any sorry to interrupt you again but did at any point that you not come out because you just think well i'm not so into it and because it's not always easy to judge your own stuff you know well what I mean? it, it was always going to come out but it were we but the the impact it had definitely surprised us you know i i remember thinking cool this is going to drop heavy but no way different to I'd thought with a, a numerous other dub chasm tunes that Digi had suddenly ended up mixing off, you know? Um, so with that one, yeah, again, I remember talking when we were playing in um, Brooklyn and, and we, you know, we had a barbecue at the promoters and somebody was talking to me from out there saying, you know, Hex is at Dub Stye's place. Yeah, that's right. Then somebody was saying to me like, what, you know, about what's the formula. And I was like, I realised at that point, you know, people really think that we've got some sort of special formula for this. And um, and it, it that just wasn't the case. I think it was just things coinciding and, again, us bringing our different uh, talents to the table. So, you know, Digi's always been a great musician and I've got a, a, a varied collection of reggae music. I'm into an exterminator tune as much as I'm into a disciples tune as much as i'm into a an old aggravators dub you know and the thing with digi is i've always been able to say oh you know it'd be wicked to do this style and then literally blink of an eye he's he's tapped something out and you know it, it's it's sounding pretty on point so it's like yeah well, he's a very very like talented like producer and musician for so sure. ha- yeah hats off to digi for that you know and he's he's worked so tirelessly at perfecting his craft and that uh, over many years and it and so that that combo ends up with dub chasm stuff being varied and, and and that and i think when it came came to victory it we approached it no differently than we did um any other dub chasm release at the beginning it was like given to abba we we, we were playing it and then um it was causing a vibe you know a stir in the dances we played it at but not not anything any different to any any of the other dubs that we've been firing out really and we gave we gave the plate to abba and then he um he he started to play it but he lit the fuse at notting hill carnival when he ended with it i mean it really did light the fuse and then this is what i mean by it happening at a specific time it happened at a time when the internet was really firing with social media. Yeah, it's kind of like the first viral dub thing. In, in a, a way, yeah. Like it, that, it, that classic, like, look at the vibe that tune's creating, which now people try and, like, do kind of... They sort of try and calculate how they can do that to sell their tunes. But I guess back then it was just like, oh, we managed to film and play it. it doesn't it look great? I'm exactly that, it. Steve. Yeah, it was, it was that. It's like my dodgy little recording from my camera. You know, it was just, uh, oh, let's capture the vibe. And um, it went, it, it just went crazy. And we knew, we knew from then that this tune was going to be bigger because we we'd never had so many messages sent sent to us you know everyone was just asking they were even getting angry at us you know like what why won't you let off this tune and we're like well we were we weren't we were just sticking to the same sort of thing we'd always do if we've given it to abba we're not giving it to other sounds so um that carried on and then abba just kept you know running and running it we we ended every dance with it abba ended every dance with it and as i said at that point you got youtube I mean, nowadays it's so different. Facebook holds back the reach of YouTube videos and all the all sorts. Facebook hold, holds back the reach of your own posts, for goodness sake. It's a flipping minefield of trying to promote stuff online now. But back then, I could announce on our Dubcas and Facebook that Digi and I have gone for a cup of tea and you get <laughs> loads of likes and shares, you know. It was, it was, a, it was a time, it, it happened at that exact window when things weren't, um restrained online so we we pressed a thousand copies and you know we we a friend in in bristol runs rewind4.com so we said oh we'll we'll give you a f- the first few and you can do an upfront exclusive and to promote it we just knocked together uh clips of videos because we've been playing all over and so it obviously so had abba and we got we had little bit clips from glastonbury and boomtown and various festivals rotterdam and we we just pieced them all together ourselves in um iMovie and whacked it up on online and <laughs> it just it just went crazy because everyone knew it and it, it was announced it was coming and so 
I remember walking the dog um, early one early the next morning after the tune had gone gone for sale live at midnight the night before, and um, and I I text I messaged Dan and I said how's how's it gone the upfront exclusive and he said well they're gone and I said what do you mean they're gone how how many have you sold and he said. He said, they've all gone. I said, a thousand records in a few hours. I, I said, there must be a mistake. I was just like, didn't believe him. And uh, and he, yeah, he swore that it was true. And it just kept happening. <laughs> we kept pressing. And then we'd press again. And it was just, it just got ridiculous. And um, yeah, I, I, I'm still kind of, we're still mind blown by that. Yeah, well, congrats. I mean, that's like, it's great to see those kind of successes. And I can't help thinking as well that it also came at a time when, the internationalness of sound system had really taken off for like, you know, it got established in France and Italy, but then worldwide, you know, Latin America, all, all over the place. It's kind of a bit of an anthem to celebrate kind of, you know, the the growth of sound system worldwide because you, you hear it everywhere. But, you know, from going to country to country and stuff, it would, it literally became... I could tell, I could, you know, you can read the crowd, I could sense from the crowd that they're obviously waiting for victory. Um, but also they're waiting for me to dip the music and, you know, set, you know, go bam, 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 and then point the mic at them. And it, everyone wanted to do have their moment because they knew it would be filmed and they knew it would go online. And everyone just wanted to be involved in that buzz that was going around. And I suppose that's the power of, of, of the internet and the scene expanding and us all being able to share. I mean, it comes a very long way from when I was having to send a cassette tape out of a recording from a radio show that only went out to the inner city in Bristol, let alone, you know, and it, it's, it, it comes a long way. And I think that's very special to us. And, and, and it's amazing to, um, I mean, I dread to think how many times I've actually had to play victory now, but it was, uh, it was an amazing, um, amazing vibe when you know the reaction it ended up being like i remember playing at um what's that festival is it fusion festival in germany the one on the old airfield yeah, yeah. crazy festival and i remember us playing there and we were we weren't in a dub corner we were on some big stage and um and they had these when, when victory came on they put on these huge flame what are they called um pyrotechnic things yeah that's it and and you got these uh, flames going up in the air with the fanfare of the victory horns and i remember thinking god this is absolutely crazy you know there's there's been so many moments where of in different countries where people wanted that vibe i i heard it was on your contract yeah. that you have to have pyrotechnics for the victory we need to horns change it now. definitely <laughs> but you know going back to that whole formula thing i hope that comes across that it, it kind of never was a formula it was just it was just a natural thing and and you know we we had back way before victory we had a tune called every lion we gave um we gave a cut to shaka where i wrote out some words and digi voice them and put a vocoder over his voice um warrior warrior jashaka di zulu warrior and um on a kind of loop and shaka uh, Digi rushed over and managed to meet uh, Shaka at Music House, and Shaka cut the tune, and um, and Shaka closed every session with that dub, practically every session for a good few years. And that that tune, I remember at the time, ja it was like fastest selling record ever on Jam Jawaria music dot com, you know, on his on his site and stuff, and it was going mad on the Blood and Fire forum. You remember that era, <laughs> and. Um, and so it, it, what I'm trying to get get at is it was nothing different with Victory. It's what we'd always done. Um, but because of the timing with the internet and exposure to stuff, and like you said, it kind of going almost viral in the dub scene, um, I think that's why people noticed it more and, and, and ended up thinking, oh, you know, these guys... Of I I I mean I almost wish we did have a formula because then every every tune would sell in their thousands I'd be a happy man <laughs> of course <laughs> of course if if only it was that simple well obviously we've been talking for quite a while now as well so it's like I wonder what kind of things we can look forward to from Dub Chasm sort of and and yourself over the sort of because you're you're relaunching the radio I know that and I guess, I guess there must be some Dub Chasm of course yeah um the, yeah I'm really pleased that the Sufferers Choice Show is about to come back on air. There's a, a station called SWU FM, Southwest Underground, and they've been granted a five-year license in Bristol. So I'll be actually 
actually be back on the FM. Big up all taxi drivers. And, um, That's it. And, it's oh, one for the Uber guys. Yeah, and obviously I'll be on, um, it'll be on the internet as well. But um, I'm really looking forward to that. I'll probably run the, the, the show monthly. So that will, you know, 2021 will be 25 years of, of, of the radio. So, I, yeah, I'm really looking forward to pushing the show, getting everyone's music promoted again and hopefully running a celebration then about being back on air next year and not being in the lockdown. Um, and from Dub Chasm, we've got some, um, we've got a lot of tunes that we've been running on Dub Plate for ages that, that we're going to get out. Maybe a few reissues because the demand seems to be there. And um, yeah, a, a few more interesting collabs with, um, you know, even, um, with people outside of, of the root scene and from other genres, which we've always liked to do. So there's, there's lots in store with, um, with dub chasm releases and also a little news flash for myself is I'm about to, um, launch, uh, to coincide with the radio show. I'm about to launch a uh, sufferer's choice SC 001 record label where, um, yeah, there's a tune from Manasseh, uh, that he's built specifically for for the, for the label, and there's a there's a string of releases to come on on that label, which is going to be exciting because Digi and I have um, run our label specifically to put our own dubcast and stuff out on. So this is going to give me the um, give me the platform to be able to release other people's stuff as well and tie it into the radio show. So yeah, lots of exciting stuff in store. Nice, nice. Sounds good. Well, it's been great, like talking to you. I mean, it's such a we we, we could really talk forever. I've, I've got a list of things, and we have there's so many things we haven't covered. We could no. do a whole show <laughs> just about vinyl, but we'll talk about that. Oh, next God, time. we didn't even touch on that. Yeah, we, me and you could definitely speak for ages on that. <laughs> <laughs> But one, one thing I'm doing at the end of each interview is I'm asking the same question to people, um, just a silly thing to say at the end, and just I'm just asking um, what would you want written next to your name in the Book of Darb, just something kind of associated that you, you'd want to be associated with with, with uh, Strider, Dubchasm. So I'm, I'm writing it in the Book of Dub, Strider, Dubchasm. So what, what would you want written next to it? Um, I would like... Um to have been recognized as particularly for the radio show that uh, that it's up, hopefully uplifted people you know and um so if people have been uplifted you know it's, it's it can be tough for people and i've had some wonderful feedback over the years through uh, listeners of the radio show saying how the, the show's kept them going they've even moved away and then moved back to bristol and it was still going and that consistency and that vibe has kept them going through hard times and that that's meant a lot to me because you know the music is the is the voice of the sufferer it's the cry of the poor always has been and and always should be so that you know if people have been uplifted and it's helped them along their way that that means a lot to me so i hope i hope that would be um that would be mentioned and in terms of teachings in dub you know i hope some of the teachings have have literally been been passed on and it's it, that's given um people a a window into a, a world of sound system that they might not have other otherwise seen or experienced. And in Dubchasm, yeah, in terms of Dubchasm, I, I hope that, you know, our releases are what stand the test of time. And um, it's, you know, it's lovely to know that some people, because we bother with the artwork as well, that they're, that they're up on display and stuff. And I hope that, 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 um, you know, that, that can, that goes a long way with us. I'm really, just we're just still to be honest for on behalf of digi as well we're just still so happy to play a part in the scene we love so um yeah well i think the very fact you're talking about reissues means that that longevity is there you know what i mean yeah yeah hope so nice cool well strider thank you very much for being on the podcast so it's been a treat nice one steve thanks for having me on and uh big up to all the listeners bothering to tune in big up Thanks again for joining me and Strider for this 15th episode of the Life in Dub podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to Life in Dub. And if you enjoyed it, you can still get yourself an I Live My Life in Dub t-shirt by following the link at lifeindub.com. If you have any comments or suggestions about the show, as usual, just email me, vibronix at gmail.com. Most importantly, though, thanks for taking the time to listen to the show. I'll see you all again in two weeks for the next Life in Dub podcast. 